You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers about hikers for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Welcome back to the show. I don't know whether you came here deliberately or not, but you're on with me, Mighty Blue. And this is my podcast all about backpacking, hikers and trails. This is Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. And today our main guest is one of those massive hiking overachievers. We've got somebody who clearly didn't think he'd done enough by hiking the AT, the PCT, the CDT, the John Muir Trail and several other long hikes. Nope, Rue McKenrick wasn't satisfied with that resume. He decided that he was going to build his own trail, as you do. And not any old trail. This is the American Perimeter Trail, and when Rue's done, he expects it to be, ooh, about 12,000 miles long. As you can imagine, this is a true life goal, and Rue is giving his all, and sometimes maybe a little too much in his pursuit of his dream. Rue will be along shortly. Then we catch up with Katie Wessling of Phoenix. Katie had... It must be said, something of a comfy start to her 80 through hike, but this week she's actually set up and taken down her tent in the rain. It's probably been a little bit sobering, but as I said to her, welcome to the Appalachian Trail. Katie will be along after Roo. Now, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I'm taking a bit of a sabbatical over the summer. The show's going nowhere, though, and I'll still be on the show every week and doing one of my normal shows once a month. The big change is that I've handed the podcast over to Ryan Hopkins, JR. And Ryan has some great plans for this summer. He's even included my monthly show in his schedule. I asked him for his plans and was blown away by the spreadsheet he sent me with some very ambitious plans of who to interview and when. The best thing, though, to me, was his plan to visit the trail regularly from his home in Asheville and his parents' place in Virginia. And he's going to seek out this year's through hikers to see how they're doing. So if you have a family member or a friend out there, Or even if you're just going to follow somebody on YouTube, Ryan is going to try and find them and we'll bring them to the Mighty Blue Show. I'll be talking with Ryan about his plans after Katie. Finally, as ever, Larry Luxembourg's Walking the Appalachian Trail evokes memories of traditions and this week it's about the general silliness (laughs) and habits habits of people on the trail. So let's get started. I'd like you all to meet a very focused guy. This is Rue McKenrick, or just Rue. So this week, we've got another one of those hiking overachievers. This is Rue McKenrick. Hey, Rue, how are you? Hi there, Steve. Good to see you. Well, as I say, you are a massive hiking overachiever, um, and, and that really is not an exaggeration, is it? Tell us about the name of the project that you're working on, and we will talk about it later, but so people get a feeling for what this is. What is the name of the project? Yes, the name of the project as it started was the American Perimeter Trail Project. And Mm -hmm. I'm still doing the hiking and scouting piece of that. But now that is under the guise of the American Perimeter Trail Conference, which is a nonprofit 501c3. But that is exactly what it is. (laughs) This this is a trail that is exactly what it says it is. It is the uh, perimeter of America. So what exactly is that? I mean, where do, where are you planning to go? Literally round America? Uh, I, I never really knew. I mean, I've always uh, considered this first hike of the American Trail a scout hike. And there will be many more. Um, right now, I, I'm planning to put uh, a trip together for when I'm done with the hike component of this to go back. So a lot of the way on the route, I had kind of an idea. I mean, I'm working with the perimeter of the United States, but then how do you find public land and ways of traversing different public lands or wilderness areas? And so the perimeter decides it, but then besides that, I made decisions day to day as I was out there. Wow. Mm -hmm. And we're going to come back to about the perimeter trail in in a minute, but we'll talk mainly about that. But I want to talk quickly about your your background a bit of your hiking background and when we spoke previously because I always take notes when I'm speaking to people you told me that you've always been 
a complete nature boy. <laughs> How did that manifest itself in you? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the first realization of it, maybe in a different kind of atmosphere, because I, w- I grew up with four brothers and we had land. And, nice, uh, nice. and so that's just like, you know, we took care of each other. Our parents kind of let us go and do what we needed to do there. They were on the property as well. So, uh, but I mean, I think the way that it started to manifest further, like at least in my awareness, is through probably like church camp, um, family right. vacations, you know, the kind of normal story. Also, I, I grew up right off of the Appalachian Trail. And so I was lucky enough to have access. You know, I had access that a lot of people growing up don't have or, or haven't had. So, and so how close were you to the trail? Where, where, where were you uh, when you were brought up? Right. So I, um, on trail, it's right at the halfway point, or it's not the technical halfway point of the Appalachian Trail, but um, it's near Pine Grove Furnace, right. Gettysburg, right. Pen- Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And so when uh, I was growing up, we lived a couple of miles away, and then my parents ended up buying a house on top of a mountain that the Appalachian Trail comes over. So you could you could walk through the back of their property, and wow. you would, and you would be on the trail. So when so, I so when I did my through hike, I actually I was living in Atlanta, Georgia. So I left my home in Atlanta, Georgia, and walked <laughs> to my I walked right in the backyard of my parents. Oh, uh, that is Texas, so cool! And, and <laughs> I hadn't seen them for a while, and my dad was out. I think my dad was out watering some plants or something, and I just kind of appeared out of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dad. How was, how was hey, 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 Dad. So, so, what about? so you knew, so you knew about the AT um, growing up being fairly near. Did, did you? Uh, the time when you were younger, did you have any intention or thoughts that this might be something I'd like to do? Or were you just generally into the outdoors? I had given uh, backpackers rides over the years um, oh, right. after, I, after I turned 16. Um, right. And uh, I had seen, talked with backpackers all the time on the trail. And I like to ask them questions like, you know, um, maybe now what's your motivating uh, motivation factor for starting a through hike but they would be halfway at that point so it's like what's your motivation for going on yes. and 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 that was a reasonable know, question of all yeah it's a good question not why you started but you're halfway now so you know what keeps you kind of going you could have any number of answers from that because there's so many mo- different motivations for long distance backpacking were you impressed by those did that did those answers impress you because when you got a thousand miles under your feet you know you kind of do want to get it done don't you so were you what do those answers mean to you oh i remember too and i that i must have been like 15 or 16 i remember these two ladies uh that i met which used to be an old resupply on the at called Hennicles market it's no longer there but um they told me that they play in the woods and that was it. That's all I needed to hear. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I honestly, I probably track all my backpacking to that kind of inspiration. I remember speaking with many of them. I remember hiking and backpacking up there. I knew I liked hiking and backpacking, but there was something about when this lady said, well, we spend every day playing in the woods. I thought to myself, sign me up. <laughs> There's a great way to distill it, isn't it? We just play the woods. We do. We literally do. We 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 wake up every morning. We pack our tent up. We get walk in and we eat a relentless amounts of food all day. Then we stop and sleep again and repeat the process. So playing in the woods uh, subs out pretty well. And you did tell me that you once got lost at summer camp. This is kind of weird, and I'm not sure mm. how I took it when you told me this, but you said that the adults weren't in the least bit concerned about you. What do you think they saw in you that allowed them to be relatively relaxed about you being lost? I I really don't know. I can't imagine me doing that with like little ones, but um, Hmm. I don't think anyone was in comp. Well, I, I think that for some reason there was this thought and they relayed this to me later that even the campers were like, well, if it was someone, we're glad it was rude. They thought for some reason that uh, maybe I could stay safe. And I mean, it actually turned out I intuitively did some things uh, while being lost in the woods that I wasn't trained. I was a little kid. I did. My parents didn't hike or backpack. So like um, 
I intuitively did things that I needed to do when put Level. in the situation. Well, like for, like for instance, so I was a kid, so it was the middle of the summer. So when thirsty, drink. So I found water and I intuitively knew like, go find a stream. There's probably a stream lower down on the mountain sure. over here. Sure. And just don't worry about treating it or anything. Just drink it because you're dehydrated. Um, things like that. I intuitively just kind of, new because some people um i know that sounds obvious but some folks won't know like if you're thirsty mm. just go get some water in you from uh, somewhere <laughs> and i don't think you realize also when you're hiking how thirsty you can get the until it's too late yeah you should, you should kind of be drinking before you get too thirsty yeah. so how long were, how long were you kind of lost for then yeah so i was out there for um a good part of a day and a night um wow. they did put out people to find me they ultimately did i remember being afraid of them because i was a kid and so <laughs> i was told to stay away from people so even when i got lost out in the woods i saw them before they saw me and i hid from them because, <laughs> yeah so i was like trying to get back to camp get home but i hid from them because they were strangers and i i couldn't see what was going on and then um i must have heard them yell for me or something and then I came out, but my first reaction was, oh, people hide. Yeah, uh, wow. Yeah. Do you recall feeling quite comfortable in the woods then at that stage? I did. Yeah, I mean, I was afraid because there were definitely bears in the area. Um, I'm not, I don't worry so much with bears now, but um, at that time, they definitely had my attention. And, <laughs> and so that was pretty much the thing I was scared about the most. I had a romanticism uh, from reading like books like My Side of the Mountain where young people, you know, in this situation, it's a young boy who sure. lives in the Catskill mountains. He just leaves his family and goes and lives in the mountains <laughs> at the heart of a tree. And that was just, you know, I'm like my side of the mountain. It was almost Sign like a up. blessing. I, yeah, I thought, I thought, <laughs> even though I was a kid and I was scared of the bears, I remember thinking like, yeah, my side of the mountain. <laughs> that's yeah. so cool so mm -hmm. before we move, get into the conversation about the apt i know you've had quite the hiking pedigree as i, as I mentioned earlier uh, as i understand it, you've done the the long trail the john muir trail and the triple crown so you've kind of done heck of a lot of miles already on trails and um, while i know that each hike is different which of those trails or maybe even the time you spent on those trails was a favorite and why or do you see get something different from every single hike you do Oh, I, yeah, I don't think I like to pick favorites um, because backpacking and hiking for me is a learning process. So, um, so usually my favorites are the ones in which I learned the most or I was challenged the most. Yes. Yeah. So for me, um, like I go on backpacks and hikes that are more like a vacation recreation for me. Um, I go and do trips that are more of a challenge for me. And then I'm a professional backpacker, so I do trips that are part of the professional backpacking piece. And so they're, they're very different. So I don't know if I want to choose favorites, but I, I really like the ones where I learned something new and got challenged uh, scenery-wise. Like, I love the John Muir Trail. I've been through there a couple of times. Um, I've, I've I've missed out yet again today. I'm getting selected for the for the for the uh, permit. Okay. I've, got, I've got about another two weeks, and they still haven't selected me yet. I'm gutted about that. I really am. Oh yeah, my! I'm, yeah, because <laughs> your other option is I did this once. I was in uh, the high Sierras and had to sleep outside of a ranger station, waiting for a permit. Oh really? And there, you... and there was a line of people in sleeping bags behind me. Wow! We're wow. all just laying out on the in the parking lot in our sleeping bags because it was first come first serve. So as soon as they open the door, you want to yeah. be in line. Yeah. So if you went the night before, could you get one? Do you think in most cases? Oh, gee, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm a little reckless, so <laughs> I wouldn't want someone yeah, to think. just, yeah, I'm a, <laughs> I wouldn't want someone to go there on a whim. You know, that, no, no. that hike, I didn't know I was going on that hike. I'd, I only went on that hike because I broke my hand and um, my wrist and uh, I couldn't work. So otherwise I wouldn't have gone on that hike. So right. it, was a, it was a last minute thing. My friends had been going for, they'd been planning for a year and I just called them and asked if I could jump in the car the, the next day. I just broken this stuff. I, I got hit on my bike. 
I got hit by a vehicle on my bicycle. Jeez. Uh, um, and he took, it was a hit and run. They left. So uh, I was planning on working the next month or so while they were going to be on trail. So I wasn't going, I always told them I wasn't going to go. And then um, this happened, this accident happened. And then I couldn't work because my job was physically demanding at the time. Sure. So, so instead I went backpacking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, what, a, what a perfect alternative. And, <laughs> and as I said to you when we first talked, I, I know where I want to go with this conversation. I'm going to talk about the APT right now. But just before we do, again, <laughs> you, said, you said you're a professional backpacker. Mm-hmm. Is, that, is that a self-given designation? And does it make your hiking more of a job or a joy? Oh, good question. So... I wouldn't be able to to define that necessarily. I mean, I, it's just, it's like if you're a professional at anything, if you make a living doing it, then that's what I, you know, so for me, I- but Is it still a joy? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I haven't, I've only gotten, received like supporting myself uh, through backpacking for a couple of years. Um, but as far as the joy part, I think there can be a misunderstanding there with the kind of backpacking I've done as compared to some of the vacation more like backpacking that I've done because um, it it, it, it can be different as far as the joy, the joy in my process is a little bit different because though I'm working, I'm not just like, um, well, I'm not out there backpacking for self-promotion. I'm creating you know, hopefully, well, not hopefully, I'm creating uh, America's next biggest conservation movement and long distance backpacking trails. So when I'm out there, I'm working. Does it, the enjoyment might come in another way. Um, And I always say, it doesn't have to be fun to be fun. Oh, no, you're right. And frankly, it's often not fun at all. You know, embr- embracing the suck is a definite thing on, on, on long distance hiking. There's no question. So let, let's talk about the AP, APT now. And I'm calling it the APT. I presume you do, the mm-hmm. app, uh, the American Premier Trail. What was the original vision um, and where did it come from? Were you just sort of sitting there having a beer one day, you thought, oh, I know what I'll do. I'm going to walk around America. Or was there something that you thought that, would add value as it were to people's lives. It was a vision. So it was a vision probably about um, 12 or 13 years ago. Right. Um, Ordinary day. um, I'd already completed the triple crown. Okay. And um, I was just at a uh, ski resort and I just saw it. It was almost like a glimpse. I just saw it. The uh, the vision I just saw. I saw like a map and me walking around it. Wow! And, and then after that, I um like then it went into the mental process of like what the heck was that or what's this? Um, but at that point in time, it was just like a calling. It was almost like a whisper. It's one of those things where I think I've had several in my life, but I discount them. And so I'm going to encourage anyone out there if you have a vision, oh, uh, yeah. be, be careful. Well, I don't know if you have to follow, but you have to make a decision. <laughs> So then for 10 years after that, I played with the idea. I would make contacts. I'd do a little research and I'd drop it because I was just, it wasn't in the works, I guess. And I finally, I basically kind of, I had a traumatic brain injury a couple months before I left to go on the APT. Uh And almost in that moment, uh, I mean, as soon as I recovered, well, I mean, really the day after the uh, traumatic brain injury, I... Uh, quit my job and just had that vision again. Jeez. And I was and I was like, I guess I'm leaving in a couple months to go on the American Perimeter Trail. I always knew that it was the main purpose was to build the trail. I didn't have to hike it. In my vision, I saw it that way. But I knew I could stay at home and just do this from an office, create this trail. But for some reason, like the the vision told me that I was going to actually be hiking this with a, a vision like that become, comes a, a lot of responsibility. And for anyone out there who's a creative person or feels a need to express themselves outwardly, I'm a musician myself, and I know when you aren't expressing or sharing your work to the outside world, 
what ends up happening is depression can come in and um, also just a sense of like, I'm not living my true self, my true essence, my true life. Uh And there's an amount of suffering that comes in that when you are given the opportunity or given the vision, if you don't follow it, you will suffer greatly until the time where you decide that absolutely I'm not doing this. So after I had the TBI, and like I said, I had this vision again, um, I knew right then that day I would make a decision. I'm either going or I am never thinking about this again um, wow. Wow. because I don't want to suffer. I don't want to suffer. Over so what this. was that thought process? And you, you just had to make up your mind then and there, or did it take a few more? You said you quit your job a day later. So you must have made that decision fairly quickly, didn't you? Yeah, it was pretty much then and there. Um, I was the only one that knew about it. <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, but, but take I didn't us back. tell my work. <laughs> I, I want you to take us back to the to the the, the original vision ten years before, mm-hmm. uh, about about ten years before. Um, t- so take us back to that time. What what did you see, and how different did you expect the APT to be from other long distance trials? Because obviously you've done those long distance yeah. trials. Did you see in your mind this was going to be something different, or did you think it would just enter the the pantheon of, of long hikes in America? No, I don't see it that way it to me the way that i first saw it was very circular so the route like if you would place it on the united states the way i first saw it was in a just a perfect circle which is not the that's not the perimeter of the united states you know that won't get you to the perimeter um so i saw this circle and I just knew instantly that that was representation of uh, unity, harmony. And, you know, I don't wear this on my sleeve with a lot of pride that I'm an American. It's kind of off-putting, especially because I've done international traveling. And But this, but outside of the political piece, um, this is my homeland. It can't mm-hmm. be anywhere else. I was sure. I was born here. If I live somewhere else, um, this will always be my homeland. And it's kind sure. of it's one of those things like the first cut is the deepest. And I have a real affection for the land and the people here. Not that it's greater than anywhere else, but I'm connected to it in a way just because this is where I came out of the womb. This is where I was birthed. So I knew that it wasn't just a project for long distance backpackers. It wasn't just a project for me. I knew this was an American project. And what do I mean about that? Well, I'm still investigating that and learning more about what that is every day. That's interesting because one another of the notes I took, which I thought you didn't we didn't discuss it much, but it's an interesting thought that you said, actually said to me, unless I read it wrong, you said that the American perimeter trail is not for long distance backpackers. And if that's the case, who is it for? Yes. Uh, let me clarify a little bit there. So, I mean, it's this, my mentality is the same as maybe like the creation of the Appalachian trail per se, that was not created as a long distance backpacking trail. Um, Earl Schaefer didn't, I mean, he didn't like that till way later. And when he reported that back to the ATC, they actually didn't believe him. That's right. Because they didn't develop it for that. It was meant for millions of, and I'm not saying Americans, just people that they're, they occupy this space, people that are here in America, go and enjoy this. And every year there's millions of people that enjoy the Appalachian Trail that are not through hikers. So what I'm saying is that not that this is, uh, not a trail for through hikers. Absolutely. If you're out there and you want to do it, like contact me, let's talk. That's, that sounds great. Have fun. Make it your <laughs> adventure. Um, but I am not uh, targeted. The American Perimeter Trail Conference, what I found building this community over the last year and a half is that it doesn't have a type. And so I, it doesn't, there doesn't need, I don't want people to look at me and think this is what we're doing here, that we're trying to provide opportunities for people like me to go do this. Quite to the contrary. Like I said, my hat's off to you if you want to go through hike it, 
But this was supposed to be for communities, for families, for children, for school groups, for long distance backpackers, for section hikers, for people who want to have a picnic or people that are just so psyched that their car just drove over the APT that they crossed it, <laughs> that they jump out and take a picture like they like I do on the Appalachian Trail all the time when I'm back east. Because it makes me feel good and it makes me feel connected to this land and these people. And yet, funnily enough, uh, and I'm, I'm now jumping off, off totally, and I don't normally do this, I pr- pr- pretty much stay in order, but now you've said that, mm-hmm. one of the things you said to me, and I'm going to ask you about your journey you've just had, you, you, you've finished for a while and you're going back on in spring, I know. Um, you, you, you made this really interesting comment to me. You said, of course, there are no trout towns at all. And you weren't well received in some of the towns you went into because they kind of didn't know who or what you were, did they? Yeah. So, because of course, on the AT, you know, the trail town, you go through Damascus, people expect smelly, scruffy people to be there. But some of the towns you went through, they were quite taken aback by you, weren't they? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say that the whole town was shocked. Uh, what no. I would say is during my, during my Triple Crown experience, I never had a conversation with law enforcement. Um, right. And then, you know, I brought it to light with you that I had um, like 20 interactions with law enforcement while I've been hiking this trail. And I attribute that to being in non-trail communities uh, in the sense that they don't, like when I come into town, they don't look at me and think that's a long distance backpacker. Um, They think I'm a stranger and it can set off. Um, some alerts because these places um, it's not like a trail town where there's backpackers in and out all summer Uh, when you walk into some of these places and you have a backpack it's really it does feel like there's a lot of eyes on you and there is so um, yeah there's a very different experience as far as the reception and it's a bigger issue really Um, you know I say that the issue is trail town like non what i call non-trail towns or non-trail communities or non-trail regions Uh but really it's just the separation of humanity it's it's the psyche of the human being it wants to separate divide and catalog and we do this with each other daily i'm wearing a red visor right now and i'm sure someone's been like uh i don't like people with red visors It's, it's a natural thing that happens and i guess it's a safety mechanism and we say we see it play out in large uh, national, social, and political conversations, and um, and it's uh, it's done uh, mostly unconsciously. So just know that when I had these interactions, I'm not necessarily blaming anyone, but I couldn't find a real um, like silver lining in having all this engagement with law enforcement. And it recently just came to me through a series of uh, mindfulness practices, looking for what is the purpose in being stopped so many times and being frisked and being searched and having to sit and wait while they run my license. And sometimes just sitting somewhere for hours, waiting till I was told that I could go. And what I found out is the entire point of me hiking not the entire point, but a big part of me hiking the APT is that it is a scouting mission. Sure. And so what that did for me is identified some issues in some areas where I need to do some work because it is absolutely my goal that everyone can hike on this trail without being concerned that they're going to be picked out or discriminated against so how do I do that process? I'm going back to have those conversations. I had several conversations before, while I was on trail, and I'll have more after I'm done with the trail. And I'll meet with those um, police departments and with those mayors and those local bureaucracies. And I'll let them know we're bringing a trail through their community, and they're going to start seeing backpackers. They're going to start seeing hikers, and they shouldn't be afraid. These people are okay. I'm sure um, you must have had conversations and good conversations with people as well. I mean, you can't just have had a, a full-on conflict with the police all, all the way around. You must. Some people must have thought, "Oh, good on you for doing this." Surely there were there was some positivity out of this with people you met, wasn't there? Oh, absolutely. Two of the police, <laughs> two of the police officers are still friends of mine. Um, 
we stay in contact and they give me an interesting perspective because when I, you know, this, I had this experience and I'm not sure how to process it or deal with it. I call them and say, Hey, listen, I'm really struggling over, um, you know, building this trail. I'm concerned about people's safety, about being in non-trail regions. And you kind of have to make the community more into a trail community. Let's say not make it, but just give it the opportunity. To, Let it grow, yeah. And in hmm. fact, you know, you you can see, uh, although with such a, a vast area that you're talking about, and it is vast, yeah. um, do you see an attendant trail culture springing up in the future as people become more familiar with the trail? Mm-hmm. And if so, wouldn't that be interesting? Because the the approach might be different in the northwest of the of the circle, so to speak, mm-hmm. to the south of the circle. So I wonder how that that will build up, or, or do you see that there's or are you going through areas where there are already trails? Are you literally, or are you literally blazing an entirely new path? Oh, and I wanted to say something real quick. I met amazing people on the trip as well. So, Good. so sure I, 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 it's like I had some pretty intense experiences, like near death experiences. I got shot at. I had guns on me. I got chased with a club. Like stuff did. <laughs> stuff it did. It stuff happened. Um, chase, chase with the club's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah he chased <laughs> me with a club. I didn't want to fight him. Um, so I told them to stand down and, um, we were able to work it out, but, um, I yeah, you, man, you, I gotta tell you, man, you're not selling the trail here. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was already an established trail there. So I, don't oh, right. know, yeah, there's a trail that's been in his backyard for 40 oh, years. Dude. I don't, I don't know what the confusion was, that is but uh, he wasn't wearing, he wasn't wearing a shirt. He was in a hurry, I guess. But um, so, so you had a tough time anyway. You, you, and, and I know you left the trail uh, at the end of last year, I believe, so mm-hmm. October last year, mm-hmm. and you, you weren't terribly well. You, you had to recover your health, or, or and you, we didn't really go into that. And, and I'm, you look very well now, so hopefully mm-hmm. you're you're fine. But having been away from Oregon, because how long were you actually on the road when you were doing this? Yeah, it was 15 months. I was away right. from Oregon. Uh-huh. That's interesting to me because you're away for 15 months. So what was it like to go back to have to adapt again to so-called normal life? Did you uh, find that easy enough to do or not? It's terribly disappointing. Um, I'm really let down here. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll explain why. I, I left a Bend, Oregon that was pre-pandemic. Yes, and I came back to a Oregon that when I got back here, uh, they were shutting down everything again, another wave of uh, shutdowns. Sure. So um, when I got back here, there is no welcoming party. I mean, uh, I'm very active in my community uh-huh. and, I, and I'm, I'm not that active right now because um, most- No one is really. It's no terrible, one, isn't it? Yeah, no one is really. So that's just, you know, uh, volunteer opportunities aren't there. A lot of the groups, uh, spiritual groups, um, community groups that meet here haven't been meeting. So, that you know, it's been kind of disappointing because I was so alone for so long. That yes. I was really getting looking forward to getting back here and mixing it up. And I have people that are still like, you know, I have a dinner reservation with them, but it's wait, it's pending. Like they've invited me to their homes, but they're waiting on the vaccine or, or something like that. So yeah, the adjustment back this time has been um, typically, I, listen, backpackers go through this with readjusting back. Um, I, I really recommend you guys to reach out to each other. You can reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to speak with you. This one was rough because I came back here very ill. Um, and uh, yeah, just just very ill. So was that uh, was that because you're away for 15 months, or did you find was it just something entirely unrelated? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pry on what it was. It's just were were you were you feeling was this a war of attrition? 15 months of of hiking is is not an yes. easy thing to do for anybody. Yes, um, I don't know if it's easy. I mean, I don't know how someone else would respond to this, but what I can tell you is, yes, it was a war of attrition. So. Uh, we didn't know what happened. We do have an answer now. It took about a month or two to go through a lot of labs. I still have sure. some outstanding labs, but we do have an answer. I have overtraining syndrome. And so overtraining syndrome is not... I mean, I've never suffered from, by the way. But yeah. It's... <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is. <laughs> well, it's, it's, not over, it's not overtraining, okay? It's way different from that. 
Um, mm -hmm. cause overtraining is something that you can just rest and recover from overtraining syndrome, uh, basically hijacks your entire system. So oh. you'll start to see things manifest from that. For me, it was a lot. It was basically from my head down to my toes, uh, systems were failing. When I got back here, my internal organs were extremely inflamed. Jeez. Um, I had an insult to, uh, to some organs because of that. And I had been throwing up and just diarrhea all day for like two months or more before that. Um, I had stopped healing cuts and wounds um, several months before I took a break um, because my autoimmune system was so affected. And then, you know, the way that that manifests in people, then uh, as it got worse, there comes depression and anxiety sure. attacks. Sure. Yeah. Um, and so I couldn't, you know, uh, like one fun thing with overtraining syndrome is, so I was only eating a couple hundred calories the last month or two a day wow. because I couldn't keep the food down. I could not keep it in my body or I just didn't want it. And I rather just hike all day without eating than bother with it. So I would do that. I was hiking 20, 30 miles a day. And sometimes I could only force like a Snickers bar and I would force it because I was not hungry at all. So wow, right. while I'm still hiking 20 to 30 miles and I'm barely eating, when I decided to take a break, I was actually the head, my weight was actually the heaviest it's ever been in my life. So after a, almost a year and a half of continuous backpacking, I had more body fat and more weight than any other time in my entire life. That is weird. Yeah, no, it's totally weird. Are you, are you, are you well now, though? Are you, you look well, but are you, are you well enough <laughs> to go, go again, or are you forcing yourself back on the trail perhaps too, too quickly? Mm, I stopped training. So uh, I work so with right, So I, do I. <laughs> yeah, well, I work with a specialist here, and um, I, I'm just really grateful that I've been put in the right hands, and I work with a coach as well. And so I was asked to stop training like after I came off of the trail because I was very ill, but I continued to train. But I was asked just to stop. So I'm not doing any training right now. In fact, the last couple of weeks, I'm not even allowed to walk around the block. Like nothing. Jeez. Absolutely nothing. But you are so, heading back out there in the spring. That's right. Yeah, my labs, are, my labs are looking way better. Um, right. I still have some lab work to do. And then uh, the weight is like the metabolic rate is starting to equalize. So even though I'm um, eating a lot more and I'm not training now, I'm actually starting to lose weight. I know it doesn't make any sense, but that's what's <laughs> that's what happens when your um, hormonal system gets hijacked. Wow. So, so you're, you're heading out. Where, where do you where do you resume? Do you, you resume where you left off or are you going to start somewhere else? Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'll go back to North Dakota. All right. Because uh, that, was, that was a tough time for you in North Dakota, wasn't it? Oh, it was so rough. I, yeah. you know, so I where, where, do, where do you think smile. you're, how long do you think you're going to be on this time then? If you were on 15 months last time, how long are you expecting to be on this time? Oh, just a couple months. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave here in May and I'll be done before the snow starts flying. Um, and I'll be finishing my home in Bend, Oregon. Now, this may be too big a subject to talk about really here, but um, I know that conservation is really meaningful to you. Uh, how does your APT conference interact with the various communities that you touch? Do you have a voice, any voice in development, or is your, or are you not big enough as a conference to have any voice in the development? Because you've got a huge area to consider, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, I was unable to do, I, I was unable to do a lot of handshaking on this trip uh -huh. that, that was built into it. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, that wasn't possible. Of course. Yeah. Uh, Damn, uh, that's even worse, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I was, fortunately, I was able to meet with law enforcement and I was able to meet with some trail clubs and I was able to meet with some trail organizations and volunteers. I was able to do some of that, but not as much as what I wanted to. So I have, I'm going to go back. Um, sure, sure. But, but as far as like working on more of the political aspect of it, and that means getting the Oregon legislature involved and also the federal government, that's yeah. work that's going to be ongoing for the next couple of years. Sure. Uh, honestly, it's one of these things where um, – People are very excited about the APT, but um, I they they always want to ask me about my backpacking, and that gives me an opportunity to talk about 
the APT. So going forward, we'll be looking for your federal designation. Um, you know, we will definitely investigate whether we want to be part of the National Scenic Trail um, or be a National Scenic Trail. That comes with it, uh, comes with it federal dollars. And so sure. we have some outstanding grants, but for right now, it makes more sense for me to do more of this work when I return. And you, and you are, you know, you're 41 now, I believe. You turned 41 when That's you right. were last time. You're 41 now. So you've got plenty of years ahead of you with this project. This is your life's work, obviously. I presume it is anyway. Mm-hmm. hope you're not going to do anything else because <laughs> you must be exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> so where do you, and I, my original question was, where do you hope the APT will be when you turn 50? But I think it should, I think it's a far longer reach than that, isn't it? So when you turn 60, what do you expect the APT to be looking like then? Oh, I think it'll be under federal protection at that point in time. Um, I expect the Eastern, Western, Northern corridors to be fairly intact. Of course, those trails will always be moving uh, just like the AT does or the PCT. Absolutely. Yeah. They'll be moving forever. Um, to infinity, but um, uh, I would say that the I expect uh, designation protection. Um, I assume I will still be in the position as the executive director at that point in time, but that I may be working in some other capacity. Um, and what I see is a continuous trail that someone can go and hike and backpack if they want. With that being said, it's going to be similar to the Buckeye Trail or the North Country Trail in which there are plenty of road gaps. And that's the work. I mean, it was the same thing with all of the long trails. Yes. If you had hiked them, you know, 60 years ago, they'd look, well, there'd be a lot of fire roads, basically. So my my focus with the APT, like my biggest concern that's probably interesting to some of your listeners is Texas, Louisiana. Mississippi, part of Alabama, and a couple other places, uh, just because of the lack of public land. Right. Okay. Well, I I can see that. You know, I think you've taken. I, I didn't know much about it. I know you're doing the American Primitive Trail. I thought, good for you, whatever that was. But then you told us about it when we spoke before. And now you told us about it again. Now, you have taken one massive project, man. I mean, it really is, and I admire you for doing it. But is, is there any way in which people can get involved with the project apart from give you money, or is is there something that that's of value for people to help with the projects at all? Yeah, you know, we have a community Facebook page for the APT, and. Um... Well, I definitely would have, I'd like the link for that, obviously, yeah. and I'll put obviously the, the, your website on there and that. But is there something? Is there something practical people can do, or is it is it really a case of just raising money to make sure you can make this work? Yes, that's. It. I mean, the the what the community page is a good place to start. Just like if you're looking for help, sure. we need tons of help. But you know, uh, you also need someone to delegate that and make sure that that's you know that you're not just giving people tasks that aren't rewarding. Sure. Sure. Um, Please, if you're out there listening, please don't start building the trail. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we have people off. I don't know. I have people contact me. Oh, I'm out there doing whatever in some part of the country. And I'm like, please, d- please don't do that. Like that's that's going to work against us. So yeah. um, so that time is coming. And we're also like where we yeah. trail, where crews, we, trail crews and things like that. That's going to be uh, awesome. Absolutely. And, and where we share other um, trail beds. In other words, if we share another trail organization and their uh, footbed, yeah. uh, we'll be working with them as well and providing uh, support for them during that time. But um, yeah, there's plenty to do. Right now, we are funding the rest of this hike. And right. so people will be able to go online and they'll see stuff that if they want to buy for the hike, they can. If they want to give money to the organization, uh, that's fine as well. They can contribute to me personally. But for the time being, like like I said, until the hike is over, I'm not building my board anymore. I already have a board, and right. I'm not interested in adding to that really right now. Um, I'm not really interested in creating more positions. Sure. Um, and like I said, I would be doing that, but uh, it's there's going to be an interruption here because I'm going to leave. So, but we will be looking to have a regional office offices and basically many satellites throughout the United States. So this is a wonderful opportunity. If you think you're around the perimeter, contact me. Let me know what trails maybe I didn't hike 
that uh, would be a good option. And uh, we will start setting up the satellites all around the United States. I tell you, this is so exciting, man. And I really mm-hmm. admire you for doing it. And mm-hmm. you, you've taken on a big task. And, and I think you, you sound like you're the man to do it. So <laughs> best of luck with your trip going out. Make sure you stay well and bloody listen to your body. I mean, there's me, an old guy telling you what to do. And you've done all these miles. Listen to your body. If you're, if you're pooping all, all day long, you're not well. So get, <laughs> so get over it <laughs> all right so take it easy have a good time and i really appreciate you coming on and talk to us good thank you so very much for having me cheers man bye what an effort eh? he is so focused on his mission and i just hope that he can keep it going to reach his goal of giving us all a wonderful resource hopefully for use by everybody he has a very particular mindset that is sure what is necessary to get this done Listening to him talking, I'd say that we've got the right bloke at the right time, wouldn't you? And while he didn't get political, you could tell that he was disappointed by some of the undercurrents that he faced. I think his real work will be those later conversations with communities and law enforcement to establish the trail. We can only wish him well. Now, my thanks this week go to regular monthly patrons Suzanne Johnson and Todd Withrow, as well as one from Sharon James, who wrote to me saying, finally got called up, though skipped your second hike episodes to listen later. I'm going to play those episodes to coincide with my own hike. So Sharon, best of luck with your hike. I'm sure you'll be able to identify some of the issues I've found on my own hike as you fulfil your own through hike dream. I've noticed that the pace of donations has slowed a little and I hope that it's got nothing to do with my decision to step back just a little this summer. The network will still be providing you with substantive episodes to satisfy everyone. I hope that you stick around and support us going forward. Cheers. Now let's catch up with Katie Westling or Phoenix. As you hear, things are getting real. Here's Katie. Well, <laughs> we're back on with Katie in the wet. Uh, how are you, Katie? I am a wet puppy. <laughs> <laughs> so have, have you had the Ritz Carton version of a first week on the Appalachian Trail? <laughs> You're now into real things. So tell us how you've been since we last spoke. Um, pretty good, I think. I, you know, I feel good with the the miles that I'm doing. Have did, you know, one day eleven miles. Another, the the next two days like eight. Had ended up setting up my tent in the rain. Which <laughs> it started raining after I had started setting it up. Welcome to the Appalachian so, Trail. The real experience. <laughs> Here, Steve. <laughs> yeah, it is. It really is. So, so let me th- remember. Now, you've been on the trail now for about nine days, ten days, something like that, and you spent the nine first days, four or five <laughs> being um, pampered by your friend, which is absolutely the right <laughs> thing to do. So, when That's did right. your reality actually start? When did it actually start? Um, day one, <laughs> the, the the new start. <laughs> All right. So, started out of Neil's Gap and. Uh, that was a long day, 11 miles, and for me, long day. And um, that's quite a big, know, it's quite a, a big mile, so mile so early on, I think. Anyway, yeah, yeah, um, full pack, and but I felt pretty good. And uh-huh. um, you know, the shelter area was packed because it was a Saturday. Uh, let's see, was it a Saturday? I think it was a Saturday. Don't worry, you lose track of time. Uh, <laughs> you yep. Totally lose track of time. <laughs> but. But, you know, um, like this morning, last night it rained all night, and then this morning the lightning started in, and I thought, well, I gotta, I'm got i getting off the mountain. Wow. <laughs> I, stayed up, I stayed up at Trey Mountain Shelter last oh, night. So I, I've I had two very, very, very cold nights there. Both of my hikes, it was freezing <laughs> on Trey Mountain. <laughs> well, I knew it wasn't going to get any better because we were up so high, and with the lightning I wanted to get off the sure. mountain. So sure. I just packed up and headed out and had myself a little protein drink for my breakfast. So uh-huh. I'm stopping now having a little snack. So so this is now we're we're speaking on Tuesday. That was that was Saturday you came out or you came out came out Saturday. of the weekend, yeah. So you've had three nights in yeah, the woods yeah. so far? And and, yeah. and how have those other tell me about the other nights then? Nice. It's just, you know, kind of routine. So just um my tent's a, a treasure to set up and 
once that you know once you get in there you're warm and snuggly and so isn't don't you think that's <laughs> a wonderful you were, isn't that a wonderful pardon? feeling i always recall you know especially setting up in the mm-hmm. rain as long as you can keep yourself relatively dry uh, you get inside and you start taking your clothes off and getting inside your sleeping bag and making sure you're warm and then once you get warm it's just so darn cozy in there isn't it mm-hmm. it is and and it was i would say the days you know that i've been walking it it's been uh a lot of contrast, you know, warm and sunny, and today it's cold and rainy, and I've been, most of the walk has been through ankle-deep water. <laughs> you got to make sure you dry your feet out really, really thoroughly oh, when you do yeah, stop. Oh, yeah, I will. Yeah. Actually, it's kind of a cushy <laughs> feeling. Oh, God, yeah. So, anyway, but, you know, I'm warm. I have on a wool layer and, you know, clothes that when they have the opportunity dry but physically I'm feeling good mentally I'm feeling good just met so many neat people already yes, yes. tell us so, about that tell us about that what what was yeah. I mean have you did you find people were, were restrained because I, I found immediately they 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 greet you as if you you're, you're meeting them for about the fourth or fifth time did you find that as well that's right very warm everyone very warm and you know just uh checking you know everything good oh yes and you know just get it like one day i think i sent you a note about the tale of two bends oh yes tell me about that that. that, yeah that was so funny i'm sitting uh at a table at one of the shelters and i was eating my dinner and there was one bend and he was an astrophysics um, doctoral student from California. Wow. And the other was a um, vet who was um, going back to school on the GI Bill. So oh. kind of neat. Yeah. And I met another a young woman who is a veteran of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Wow. And, and she's out dealing with her own PTSD. Yes. So, yeah. but just a lot of, um, just love it's, they're, like you said you know it's like you immediately feel a connection yeah so we've well, got a com- you nice. know you've got a common goal haven't you you know and and there's there's z- and there is zero point in rooting against the other person you know you want that other person's exactly. success almost as much as you want your own and i think that's one of the wonderful right. things about being out there so you met this variety of people um have they been as you expected them to be? In fact, has the whole hike so far, apart from your first five days at the um, Ritz, uh, but uh, has your whole hike so far <laughs> pretty I much? I will never regret that. <laughs> oh, damn right! I, I, I totally agree with you. So, has your whole hike so far been as you'd expected, or is it surprised you in certain ways? I'm trying to think of. So, I would say the the variety of backgrounds that. Of people that I've met um, surprised me just a little bit. And I think that's just my own, you know, you kind of egocentric about your own hike. So, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. but, but that part, um, I have, I, I don't know. I, I, I think I was surprised by how many people were out here. Oh, really? Initially, really? But, but during the day, I don't see. You know, it's like one or two people I'll see. Sure. Yeah. For the whole day. And then suddenly we're all showing up. Yes, yes, you're all <laughs> congregating. So which was the first shelter you stayed at then? So um, I went from Neil Gap to Low Gap Shelter. Okay. And then Low Gap to Blue Mountain Shelter, then Blue Mountain to Trey Mountain. And they and were, and they're all to, full? Uh, Oh yeah, yeah, and people but you want actually to... were sleeping in the shelter, you know that. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. Until I have my second COVID shot, I'm not not going to risk that. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, you're, you're, you're probably right, but also, frankly, it's. it's I don't find sleeping in the shelter to be a lot of fun. I mean, some there are some some nights though when I, I felt I had to get in there, and I did get in there actually on Train, train Mountain Shelter because it was so darn cold and pouring as well. So, you know, yeah. so, so it is it is a very exposed spot as well, and uh, mm-hmm. it's one of the ones that always sticks it sticks in my mind. And now I, you know, it's all part of the joy of it, embracing the suck of it. Um, That's right. And. What about the trail itself? How are you finding the trail, you know, the various rocks and routes and looking at your feet constantly? You know, <laughs> you know 
no, it's up and it's down, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> and not and not one of those pointless ups and downs. Are, they're not pointless, you know, are they? <laughs> I'd laugh because, you know, on the ups, I'm sucking wind. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and, and then I have to stop for a little bit, catch my breath, yeah. and then I make up time coming down. My knees don't seem to be bothered by the downhill, so... I make time on the flat and the downhill a little bit. Yeah. So, I mean, I, so, I, 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 one I, thing I am surprised, I thought I was really, one of the things that I worried about was uh-huh. clipping on rocks right. because I've had that experience. But my shoes have good traction. So, wow. so far, I have not had a lot of slipping. Oh, God. I wish you hadn't so said that. Really I good. wish you hadn't said that. <laughs> oh, my God. Talk <laughs> about <laughs> set yourself up. <laughs> Boom, there she goes. Oh, dear. Yeah, that wasn't well, a great idea. I had one, a couple of things, something really neat. Um, trail magic. I had my, Ooh. I've had trail magic twice already since leaving Neil Gap. So wow, nice. we got to Hogpin and uh, Bob, Bobby and Mitzi, I don't know their last names, were set up. And it was about halfway through the hike and about to go up this huge mountain. And they had Caribbean black beans. Soup, oh, couscous, brownies. Oh, nice. <laughs> so we all just stopped and, you know, sat in a nice chair with a back and ate. And then at Unicoi Gap, another group had Trail Magic. So, man, I got, I keep getting lucky. <laughs> <laughs> have you, have you struck up any hiking partnerships yet? Are you hiking with somebody or, you know, are you um, just, just still pretty much I by yourself? Chat, yeah, pretty much by myself. I, I chat with everybody, you right. know, and, and there are, just some really uh, uh, sweet people out here. Yeah. You know, uh, the young men out here are, they're very sensitive and, and kind, I have found. And that's they, great. They're very kind to me. So, <laughs> you know, so that's nice. And and I haven't seen a lot of women my age. You and haven't? Women, young women, there's well, some. But, well, that's, that's, that's what I meant to ask you. I mean, what is the demography? You, uh, uh, is it... Uh, is, I mean, is it our our age group? Oh, I'm older than you, but is it our, is it people in this? Yeah, I have seen um, older men are right. hiking. Right, but not very many and older women. Not very many older women. A few. Right. Um, there were a few I saw at the beginning, but I haven't seen them since. Any children? No, so they just made uh, no children. Haven't seen any children. Okay. Uh, young people, college students. Which is great. Isn't that awesome? Don't you think? Yeah. And, and when you start talking yeah. to them, I'm sure you have already, some of them just, they've got a job and they quit the job because they want to do something else or they leave once <laughs> they've got, or they're putting it off working. But if ever there's a time to do it, it is straight out of college, isn't it? Although, as I've often said, I'm not yeah. sure I would have had the same hike or even been able to do the hike when I got out, right. of, if I'd ever gone to college, right. which I didn't, but if I'd ever gone to college, um, then I'm not sure I would have been prepared for it at that age. And I think right. I was prepared for it in my 60s. So what's yeah, next? Yeah, they're a lot more together than I was. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so what's next? Where, where, where are you now? So I am, so I'm almost halfway between, I've, I, I started about eight this morning, uh-huh. about halfway, almost halfway between Trey Mountain Shelter and Dick's Creek, Gap. Yep. And um, I'm going to do a Nero at a hostel and try out all my gear. Uh, my daughter's sending me a package that's supposed to come in cool. and then um, uh, just replace some of my uh, uh, food. And, yeah. You know. This is the life of a hiker. Of- You're actually living the life of a hiker now. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, dear. No. Well, I, don't, I don't mind getting wet, and, you know. Getting cold, as long as I, you realize that there's going to be a point when you're stopped that you can get warm. Yes, you know, I, important. I've I've had hypothermia before and had to deal with it, and you don't want to do that. So no, sure. that yeah. I'm very cognizant of. So. Sure. Okay. Well, look, I'm glad you you're well. You sound well. Um, and I I was a little concerned about what it was going to be like uh, with your first week, you know, back properly in the woods yeah. and hiking. But you sound mm-hmm. sound quite sound perky, and you sound like you're having a good time. So I will hear from you right. next week. Then, okay. That sounds good. Okay, Steve. Take it easy. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. So. Those comfy beds aren't all along the Appalachian Trail. And it isn't always glorious out there. Katie's getting the best and the worst of the trail in her early days. 
There really are few things so dispiriting as packing up your wet gear after a wet night and carrying all that extra weight of rainwater throughout the day. One thing that I saw people do on both my hikes, and I did it myself a few times as well, was to stop once the sun came out and lay out all of my gear on a rock in the sun while I soaked up a few rays and dried everything out. Very therapeutic and really quite surprisingly, it utterly lifts your spirits to know that everything's dry again. I hope that Katie is able to work that one out in the coming weeks. Now, let's hear from Ryan and his plans for our show. Here's Ryan. So, we're back on with Ryan, of all people. Hi, Ryan. How are you? I'm doing pretty good, Steve. How are you? I'm fine. And um, I'm not, you know, it's funny, actually. When I thought of what I was going to do with the show between April and October, there was only one person I thought of doing this because, of course, you have familiarity with the show itself. What did you think when I asked you <laughs> to do it? You know, I wasn't, I never know what I'm going to get when I hear from Steve. Uh, is terms nice. of, and, and I mean that in a great way because it's a very exciting <laughs> news. And so I was like, it's, you know, I didn't know if you were hiking again, if you were writing more. I didn't know where um, you were going with it. So I was so excited. Um, and, you know, some of the listeners that may not be as familiar, you know, um, that when you, on your last through hike, I uploaded the show while you were gone. And on your Camino hike, I did that as well. So um, yeah. we've been kind of going back and forth with this for, for a while now. So I was I was pleasantly surprised and um, very excited about it. And the reason I knew you could do it anyway, but quite apart from those things, you interviewed me when I was on my through hike, but I think I was in, you joined us hiking, you interviewed me at a newfound gap, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Yep. It was bloody freezing outside. <laughs> and yeah. you uh, you interviewed me in the, in the cab of the car, which was great. I could tell you knew how to ask questions to people. So I kind of liked that part of it. And uh, when I said to Ryan, just come up with a few plans of what you might do with the, the show and I, while I'm away, oh my God. He set the spreadsheet. Now, I, I know you don't want to give away all the details. What's the general thrust of what you're going to do with the show? Yeah, so, you know, I'm definitely not uh, opposed to making ambitious plans, as many people are aware from from last year. So we'll see how this goes. But um, I wanted it to be, obviously, as similar to the show as possible while still bringing in a unique kind of spin. You know, we don't want to completely change everything, but the unique elements I could be able to bring in, I wanted to try to take advantage of that. And so um, one of those is that, you know, living in Virginia and North Carolina area, I can get out to the trail and actually um, interview folks and do some hiking myself and get some on-trail interviews. I know people are really interested in, especially uh, this time of year with with everyone starting up with their hikes. Yeah. I mean, it's it's definitely an exciting time with people out there right now. And I I wonder what, how they're all coping in this, post covid is it or it's not post covid we're still into covid obviously in this sort of era with with covid how are you going to approach that do you think yeah that's that's a great point um golly i think we could probably do a whole episode on just hiking and covid and there's probably been plenty of things written about it i i would like to thank most people that i've seen and been keeping up with or doing things as safely as possible um for me personally, I mean, you know, I wear a mask everywhere. I've been really fortunate enough to at least get the first round of the vaccine. So I probably won't be heading out there until I'm fully vaccinated and still wearing vaccinated and still wearing a mask. And, um, you know, being outside and recording with a podcast is is nice because you don't have to always be super close uh, to other folks. So I think that right. there's 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 and, and, and honestly, if it wasn't for COVID, sometimes hikers just just smell a little bit. So we maybe not wouldn't be that close anyway. So, <laughs> you know, so I, I think that there's definitely safe ways uh, to do it and getting out there and, um, you know, and it, it is going to be a few months. So I would like to think things will be getting better as we get closer to the summer. And what sort of range do you think you have to get out to the trail? You say you live in Asheville. How, yeah. how far south and how far north do you think you can go? Yeah. So between my, um, you know, family's place in Virginia and then living in Asheville, I'm right, I, I within, you know, a day's drive of pretty much the first half of the trail. Um, so on the, the plan that I sent you, I think there's some kind of estimated times there on, you know, when I would really like to try to be in North Georgia, when I'd really like to be in Tennessee, when I'd really like to be in um, parts of Virginia. Sure. And then eventually I, I would like to get up to Harper's Ferry, the Maryland West Virginia, Northern Virginia area. Um, that would be great. So, yeah. So tell me about, I, mean, I know we, we had a catch up with you about, you know, your, your attempted, uh, your, your attempted height last year. It was obviously 
terribly disappointing for you. Um, do you get, uh, going out to the trails, do you get comfort from speaking to other people about it? Is this something that makes you feel good about about things to go out to speak to other people while they're actually on the trail and try to encourage them while they're out there? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, we've talked about this many a times. It's always great. You know, the trail brings so many different people in, in so many different places in life for so many different reasons, right? So I'm, I'm always sure. encouraged hearing people's stories. And, and, and sometimes it's something as impactful as, you know, someone who's just lost a family member or a loved one, and that's where they are turning. And then there's other times just people that are looking to have fun in the outdoors. And, and there's nothing wrong with wherever people fall in that, that spectrum, right? So um, it's always encouraging to see folks out there hiking. And I saw a term, you may be familiar with this. I had never heard this term until I read it yesterday in someone's blog post, Springer Fever. I think I've had that no, a little I bit. That. No, I think no. I've had that a little bit <laughs> the last few weeks because I've been seeing everyone starting in Georgia. And I was like, I think I get it. Um, and, you know, the trails, the trails there and my passion and ambition for it hasn't really wavered despite my um, attempt last year not working out. And, and I know that I'll get there and it'll be even more uh, the sweeter when the time comes. So. Oh yeah, that that moment when it happens, you're just gonna love it. Well, look, I'm I'm excited about what you got planned, and I'm excited for the fact you actually included me in your schedule as well, which is good because I, I did ask for one one week each month. But also every week, you're going to include um, the conversation that I have with Phoenix as well, aren't you? Absolutely, yeah. I think it's great to have, to be kind of uh, following a hiker that's out there, and 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 let's not forget too. I mean, a lot of my show hopes are guests that I'd really like to interview some of them on the trail some of them who have hiked in the past and some of them are people that I know and some of them are people that I've never <laughs> met but I sure would like to meet so fingers crossed <laughs> I'm able to convince them to come on the show I'll tell you what man when I saw, saw your list I thought oh my god that's more ambitious than I would have done <laughs> <laughs> so you got you got some guests I wish I'd, I'd thought of in the past but uh, so I, I'm looking forward to see how, how you how you do with that. Now, I know you're still going to want people, want to hear from people as well, aren't you? So were you happy to share your emails um, so people can email you with questions? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm sure stuff will continue to, to come to you and you'll send it to me. But my, my own email that I'll be using with the show is ryanh620 at gmail.com. And I'm open to any and all questions, feedback, if there's something you like or don't like about what we're doing, or if you say, hey, I got this person who would be a great fit for the show. I'm I'm sure. definitely open to that. So feel free to reach out. That's cool. Very cool. Well, look, good luck, man. You're going to enjoy it. I'm sure I'm going to enjoy listening to it every week. It's going to be strange for me to hear my own music and, and there's someone else introducing it, not me. But, you know, I'll get over that jealousy part. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure we're going to have a great show and we're going to have a great collaboration getting this done for the next six months. Awesome. Thanks so much for uh, letting me be part of this. Thank you, man. Take it easy. Bye. Bye. I've got to tell you, the boy's got game. He's very clear about what he wants to do and knows that I'm handing over the reins to him completely. Whatever he wants in the show will be in the show. The fact that he has an abiding passion for hiking, and the AT in particular, will help him as he entertains you all over the summer. I really hope you stick around to see where he goes. Finally today, we have Walking the Appalachian Trail by Larry Luxemburg. Reading this book has been a real pleasure for me, it's about the AT from just 25 years ago, yet it seems, I don't know about you, but for me, it seems to be an entirely different place with an entirely different cast of characters and with their manners and their stoic natures and their camaraderie. And that was 25 years ago, reading some of the superstitions and general silliness in this episode. I was reminded that it's still the same trail. It's just that the characters are new and in 25 years' time, they're going to seem so different as well. As the French would say, Plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. The more things change, the more they stay the same. I'll see you next week. A pilgrim in process. Trial society, values and traditions. All you need in this life is ignorance and confidence, and then success is sure. Mark Twain. Toby, son of Billy Goat Woodard, tied a toy cow to his pack strap. His partner, PJ Random Vine Dean, carried a stuffed bear. During the 1993 through hike, Toby walked a stretch without his pack and thus without his cow. He wondered whether to go back and do that stretch with his cow so it too would complete the whole trail. 
Hikers can be a sentimental, even silly lot. Some hikers carry a seed, a pebble, or some soil from Springer to leave at Catan. At the 1981 ATC meeting in Cullowee, Ray Hunt formed a group called SOTWFBWO, Society of Those Whose Favourite Boots Wore Out. A reflection of the attachment hikers have to their old gear, its membership stabilised at one. Figuring out the silliest thing that through hikers have ever done would be difficult, but one incident springs quickly to mind. Frank, the merry Slav, Krakovich, was lying in the grass seven miles shy of the top of Mount Greylock, the highest point in Massachusetts. Three hikers approached with a watermelon that they planned to carry to the top and eat there. Frank joined them. One hiker carried the melon, the rest carried most of his gear. At the summit, they proudly displayed their prize, offering slices to everyone, because even harder than four hikers carrying a watermelon up a mountain is for those same four hikers to devour it in one sitting. As it was, they ended up with watermelon-shaped bellies, Frank said. Every year, a few hikers become well-known on the trail. In 1993, one who made his mark was Lowrider. A harmonica-playing contortionist, he carried a walking stick festooned with salvaged garbage. In 1992, it was the Travelling Garvies. In 1990, Bill, the Orient Express Irwin. In the mid-80s, Dan Wingfoot Bruce. In 1980, it was Bob O.D. Coyote Pearson who had a long flowing beard, wrote long passages in the registers and was the first through hiker to start February the 29th and the last to finish November the 17th. Speed hikers are a little more recognisable because they're so far out of the mainstream. Other hikers criticise them, saying they can't be getting as much out of the trail experience. Groups are criticised and lampooned too, especially since most through hikers are strong individualists. Also criticised are people who stick rigidly to a schedule or who white blaze or blue blaze or yellow blaze depending on one's point of view. For all of that, trail conversations tend to be much cheerier and more positive than those in the real world. After all, people on vacation should be happier. Friendships spring up quickly and are incredibly durable. Hikers who know each other for only a few days feel closer than they do to some relatives. People of different ages, backgrounds and occupations who would normally not even meet become like family. Some say it's like the bonds that spring up in military service, especially during combat or isolated postings. Dr Lou, Tennessee Jed, Schroeder, with his wife, Dr Janice Coverdale, has a medical clinic in Hot Springs. He threw hiked in 1980 and compared the friendships to those that form among medical residents who also undergo an intense experience. Many hikers feel so strongly about the trail that they have their ashes scattered on it. Raymond Torrey, who helped build the first stretch of the AT, had his ashes scattered in 1938 on nearby Long Mountain, New York, part of the Long Path, which he also championed. Rex Pulford, the father of Dorothy Hansen, died of a stroke while attempting a through-hike, a long-held ambition. His remains and a monument were placed on the trail, not far from where he died. The remains of Howard Bassett, a 1968 through hiker, were scattered on the AT north of Jerry Cabin. There is no completely satisfactory answer to the question of why people form such strong attachments to the trail. Jeff Hansen suggested that will always be a mystery to all of us. But I wonder if it's not just that people can have a sense of adventure and a sense of belonging all at once, and people miss both of those things in their lives. Dorothy Hansen added... With other trials, you could test yourself. You could get the adventure, but you couldn't get the camaraderie. You can't help but have a fondness for it if you hiked even 50 miles of it, said Elmer Hall, proprietor of the Inn at Hot Springs. I think it's one of America's really special institutions. It's quite amazing, this combination of public interest and private organisation. It wouldn't have been possible without the government's recognition of it as a special resource back in the 30s. Many hikers' most enduring memories have to do with other hikers. Communication on the trail is primitive, but remarkably effective. The trail grapevine is a marvel. People going in different directions pass along news, as do those who live along the trail. Trail registers are the heart of AT communications. In these registers, hikers pass along news of what's ahead. They share philosophy, pithy comments, epic stories, poetry, cartoons and complaints. Hikers can track the people ahead by the dates and contents of their entries. It all gives lonely hikers some companionship. On the AT, it's a people trip, said three times through hiker Leonard, habitual hiker Atkins. When you're a through hiker, for that summer you're going to be a special person. You're part of a moving community. 
You hike with someone for four or five days and meet them again in Connecticut or Maine. It's like seeing an old friend. You're constantly meeting old friends. You form close friendships. 95% of the people in my life now are hikers. I think the reason the AT builds friendships is that the trappings of different levels of society fall away. On the AT I've hiked with people for weeks and never known what they do to support themselves or even their real names. I've missed that acceptance of people back in society. Although hikers welcome, even crave some company on the trail, they are wary of large groups and crowded stretches of the trail. Shelters may comfortably hold four or five people on a rainy night, but six or eight can be crowded. One of the 80 commandments is, there's always room for one more in a shelter. But many backpackers have memories of being so crammed into a shelter that everyone had to turn over at the same time. The more than 255 three-sided shelters are centres of 80 social life. I didn't use a tent because I really enjoyed the shelters, the community atmosphere of getting together at the end of the day and sharing stories, said Greg Pooh Nertner. Shelters never seemed more appealing than in Myron Avery's article, The Story of the Lean-Tos, which appeared in the PATC Bulletin in 1942. In the north it is a very simple matter. A floor is made of small poles which are covered over with a deep layer of aromatic balsam fir boughs. These are renewed annually and a fur bow bed is a worthy rival for the tired walker to the best inner spring mattress. Unfortunately, the custom of using fur bows disappeared, but the uncomfortable poles, dubbed baseball bats by hikers, lingered until recently. Because it's such an intense experience and they're so excited about it, through hikers seem to exist almost in a world of their own while on the trail. Sometimes it's difficult for an outsider to penetrate. Even those like Roger Brickner or Tilly Wood, who've met many through hikers over the years, find that when big groups of them gather, outsiders tend to be excluded. Conversations dwell on shop talk, who's where and who's doing what, experiences along the trail and, of course, food. Through hikers find their experience so intense that it's often difficult to relate to those who are day hiking or hiking the trail in pieces. Through hikers quickly become so close that outsiders often believe they are brothers or have known each other for years. For as long as there's been a trail, the AT has attracted characters. Mark, second wind, Di Michelli, said that over the last decade the number of characters has increased dramatically. Before, one might encounter one or two, now one might see a half dozen or more. A few of these people may be dangerous, but most add a certain colour to the experience. You can spot the characters easily, said Tom, the Pennsylvania creeper, Thwaites. They're not dressed in uniform. One character he encountered was Lothar of the Snake People. He saw snakes in sub-freezing weather when no one else did. Albie Pokrob recalled the first character he met on his 1978 through hike, Ranger Mac. He was impersonating a part ranger. I said, this is great, we'll learn about nature. Then he got to telling some stories and I knew he didn't sound like a ranger. At Wessa he would say, the Stokoas are a technical climb and you need to get your pack weight down to 25 pounds. He said he would go through my pack and give what he removed to needy hikers. When I finally left him, he said, You'll never make it through in this rain, and don't expect me to come and rescue you. It was the last I saw of him. Profile. Harry the Indian Thomas. Many people love the AT, but only one has actually lived on the trail. Harry spent most of his adult life on the trail and found a wife there. Since October 1992, he and Jan Fireball have managed the Appalachian Youth Hostel Lodge on the c Canal near Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, their way of staying close to the trail now that ailments limit Harry's hiking. They still labour mightily to complete their renovation plans. Photographer Mike Warren and I visited the hostel during an early March snowstorm. Harry, the Indian, Thomas, first came to the AT in April 1965. When he finally left in 1988, after 23 years spent mostly outdoors on the trail, he was 57. He'd seen more of the trail and met more hikers than anyone. Near the end, Harry was seeing the sons of people he'd hiked with in the early years. A Winnebago Indian, Harry grew up on a reservation in Nebraska. As a boy, he spent much of his time in the woods and became an accomplished hunter and fisherman, as well as a master of other outdoor skills. Walking to school in sub-zero weather, he grew accustomed to a hard life. Later, he hoboed around, seeing the country and working odd jobs. While working in St. Louis, he read about the AT and decided to try it. He never dreamed he'd spend so much time there. I just thought I'd see what it was like, he said. Harry, who first got on the AT at Allen Gap, North Carolina, spent most of his time in the South. 
His favourite spot was Roan Mountain, when the rhododendron were in bloom. He also frequented the Smokies, especially in his early days on the trail when hiking permits weren't needed. Generally, he'd spend a few weeks in a place and then move on. When he ran out of money or supplies, he'd work at odd jobs until he'd accumulated enough to return to the trail. Jobs weren't hard to find, he said. For a decade, he travelled north each year to Elk Park, North Carolina and Winchester, Virginia to pick apples. For a time, he guided people on the trail, including Robert, believe it or not, Ripley. Other times, he would collect cans and redeem them for deposits or rake under shelters to find money. Over the years, he made friends with many mountain people who would give him food or shelter. They'd help me out, he said. They'll share what they've got. He supplemented his diet with edible plants and was accurate with a slingshot, which he used to kill rabbits and squirrels and frighten away skunks. Much of his store of nature lore is self-taught. It all comes naturally, he said. You grow with it. At ten, he caught his first skunk. As a boy, he hunted and fished on the reservation with Lawrence Big Bear, learning much from him. I used to watch him all the time, Harry said. He'd never mark a tree. It was against our religion. When he first started out on the AT, he had only rudimentary equipment, including a Boy Scout pack and an army blanket, but no sleeping bag. He never used trail maps or guidebooks, only road maps to identify towns where he could resupply. Sometimes he'd make his own equipment or pick up discarded items. He made a pack out of a mailbag. He used nearly every possible kind of tent. Sometimes Harry would carry a backpacking stove, but he usually cooked over a fire. He was known for making the biggest meal on the smallest fire, his wife, Jan, said. I watched him make a fire when it would be pouring down rain, and you wouldn't think you could find anything dry. And I swear, Harry could smell water. He'd find water where there wasn't any water. He packed a heavy load, carrying what he needed to live on indefinitely. For a while, he even carried two packs that totaled 80 pounds. He carried a large supply of coffee and sugar in heavy plastic containers because he didn't want to chance plastic bags breaking. On a side trip along the CNO Canal, he once found an abandoned shopping cart. He put his pack in it and pushed it along the towpath for a hundred miles. Eventually, he lost control of the cart and it toppled into the water. Scurrying to retrieve his pack, he saved everything but the coffee. For company, he had three different dogs during his hiking career. He also had a pet crow for a time. It would alight near his campfire and nudge the lids off pots to see what was cooking. At Humpback Rocks, Virginia, south of Shenandoah, he employed a big rattlesnake to keep people from bothering his pack while he went into town. He tied the snake to a tree where it lay coiled beneath his pack. Nobody bothered his pack and when he returned, he freed the snake. In the early 70s, he became a shelter caretaker on the long trail in Vermont. He stayed there through the winter, the longest time he'd spent anywhere along the AT. During another winter, he camped out along the main AT, with temperatures as low as 50 below zero. He piled on layers of clothing, but mostly he learned to adjust to the cold. Another year, snow drove him off the trail in New York, when 17 inches fell in one night. That spring he hiked in Maine, and the snow was 10 feet in places, high enough to cover the eye-level blazes. Harry was camping on the side of Blood Mountain, Georgia, when he met Jan. Blood Mountain had been the site of a big Indian battle between the Cherokees and the Creeks. Harry used to feel their spirits, Jan said. It's a sacred mountain to him. A resident of Florida, Jan had long read about the AT. It became her dream to hike it, and after retiring she decided to do it in 1987. In 1988, Harry and Jan left the trail to get married in nearby Silver, North Carolina. There are 107 steps leading up to the historic courthouse. The condemned man always counts the steps to the gallows, Harry laughed. That year, they did parts of the trail, including a climb of Katahdin. While a rainstorm threatened, Jan waited on the tableland a mile and a half from the top and Harry went alone to the summit. She figured he'd be gone for an hour and a half, but people coming down said they'd seen him jogging on the knife edge. He was back in 45 minutes. He wasn't doing the AT as an alternative to anything else, said his friend Jeff Hudson. He was doing this because it was what he wanted to do more than anything else. It was the environment he operated best in and enjoyed the most. Harry didn't have a lot of financial resources, but if he ever needed things, he would always offer to contribute in exchange. That's different from most people. He didn't forget anybody who did anything for him. He was generous to a fault, Dorothy Hansen added. I think in a lot of ways it's hard for me to think of the AT without thinking about people like Harry, Jeff said. That's an aspect of the trail that makes it what it is. He was wonderful with our children, Jamie and Chris, Dorothy said. 
He spent a whole winter here, and he almost adopted them. When he and Jan were hiking in Maine, he made a little birch bark canoe and sent it in the mail for Chris. He came to visit a couple of months ago and made a slingshot for each of the kids. With a droll sense of humour, Harry can joke about his Indian heritage. When he and Jan hiked the Oregon Coastal Trail, they crossed the Pioneer Indian Trail. Looking at the trail sign, Harry said, Let me be the pioneer this time. I get tired of always having to be the Indian. Over the years, Harry has overcome his share of injuries and ailments. A degenerative bone disease in his knees finally drove him off the trail. The legs got progressively worse after a fall near Newport, Virginia. Now he needs braces all the time, but he and Jan still walk the two miles into Harper's Ferry. One time in the early 80s, Harry had a small stroke while hiking the 80 in southwestern Virginia. His left side was paralysed, but Harry doesn't give in to things, Jan said. He kept working with it for a week until he could get into town. He also sprained his ankles on the trail. Once he hiked on a bad sprain for 140 miles without support. Finally, he got to a hospital and the nurses were going to put him in a wheelchair. He said, what do I need a wheelchair for? I just walked 140 miles on it. Harry wants his ashes scattered where his close friend Howard Bassett's are, near Jerry Cabin along the AT. Asked if he had any regrets about spending so much time on the trail, he said, no, I would like to spend more time on it. Maybe one day I'll be hiking again. <laughs>